in February I read seven books which is great it's definitely more than I expected but I loved exactly none of those books which is less great. <laughs> I can split February very easily into four parts. I was on holiday for two weeks, I was in Thailand, I had four gigs in the following week and then I was ill for a week. So February truly was eventful and because I was going to be away for so much of the month I definitely didn't expect to read very much but I did manage to get through seven books. I have also almost entirely cleared my TBR that kept rolling over month by month. I only have one book left that I had started at the end of the month and I've now put it down in March because I didn't feel like I was in the mindset to enjoy it or to give it as fair a chance as like I wanted to but while I did manage to read a decent amount in February I rated nothing above a three star and at least one of these three stars is pretty generous in my opinion. I thought that it could have been me but I have actually already finished a book in March and I'm currently in the middle of two others that I'm enjoying a lot more. I've already had a four star read for March so I definitely feel like it was the books as opposed to me and I actually really need to stop gaslighting myself when it comes to my feelings on um like the books that I'm reading. Before we dive into the wrap up we will of course get into the statistics for the month. So I read very slightly more than I read in January which is impressive considering that the month is shorter and that I was so busy but I read a total of 3,132 pages across seven books which I believe is five more pages <laughs> than I read in January so I just beat January and this breaks down to an average of 108 pages per day. For the star ratings I had three two star reads and four three stars which breaks down into what is potentially my lowest average monthly rating ever which is 2.57 stars per book. That is pitiful, that is concerning. <laughs> for the demographics I read three young adult books, one new adult and three adult. For the formats these are also a little bit all over the place which reflects the traveling that I did because I listened to two audiobooks, I read two ebooks, two manga and then just one standardly formatted novel and then for the genres we had three fantasy romance, three fantasy and one romance so not too much variety there. And then finally for the places where I sourced these books from, four of them were from my own TBR that existed prior to the start of 2024. Two of them I read off Everand which is formally scribbed and one of them is a book that I hold in 2024. So getting into my first read of the month which was Splintered by A.G. Howard. This one is a classic like YA nostalgia read. I think that it was published in maybe 2012. So I was worried going into this that it was going to be cringe. It was published in 2013. So I was worried that it was going to be like really cringy and it was but in a way that I really enjoyed and I feel like it's because this is in the style of the books that I was reading in 2013. So while the content is not what I would typically read today or what anybody would typically read today. It did hit me right in the nostalgia. So this one is an Alice in Wonderland inspired story. It's set in the real world but it is portal fantasy. It does take place partially in Wonderland and we're following a girl who has madness that runs in her family. Her mother is in a mental institution at the moment and it all stems from like her great 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 grandmother who was actually Alice. So her great great however many times grandmother inspired Lewis Carroll's Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Everybody thinks that he was just like narrating the ravings of a madwoman but our main character very quickly finds out that Wonderland is real when she finds herself there in an effort to save her mother and also her childhood best friend who is of course also her love interest because this is a YA published in 2012. So I really enjoyed the contemporary elements of this. I really liked the super red flag filled romance between this girl and her best friend. We have very classic YE contemporary tropes in here like romantic tropes such as cheating, pick me girl energy, not like other girls energy, girl on girl hate, slut shaming, all of that terrible stuff that was like super common in 2013. And like I said like that is not the content that anybody typically reads or condones now but it was very very standard for the time and I felt that that was very transportative in putting me like back in that place when I was reading books like this. So I did end up giving this one two stars. I didn't end up loving it overall but I thought that the reason that I wasn't going to love it is because of how cringy I assumed that it was going to be and actually that stuff I kind of just rolled with but as is true for me with other Alice in Wonderland inspired books and retellings I still have not read the original. I really love the Alice in Wonderland movies especially the Tim Burton one. I really love the aesthetic 
basics of Alice in Wonderland, but I don't like the whimsy. I've just tidied that sofa brie. Why do you do this? I don't love the whimsy or the nonsensical nature of Alice in Wonderland and that did remain true for this retelling. So while I generally had a good time with it, it did start to lose me when we got to those Wonderland portions. So overall, like I didn't have a great experience with the book, but not for the reasons that I assumed that I wouldn't. I then read an ebook, which is Nettle and Bone by T. King Fisher. This was one that I was very excited to check out because I've heard amazing things about T. King Fisher, but also hit and miss things. And this one was just okay for me. I did definitely enjoy it but it didn't leave a lasting impression which is why I gave it a three star rating. So this one is essentially a fairy tale about a girl who has been sent to a convent because she is not allowed to marry and have children because her elder sisters are part of the the royalty, like they've married into the royalty of a different realm. So when she's younger, her eldest sister is sent off to marry this prince. And within a short space of time, she is returned to them in a coffin, like she has died. And so the next sister is sent to go and marry this prince. And our main character is sent to a convent because until an heir is produced for the throne, like she's not allowed to marry and have children herself because they would be a threat to that kingdom's throne. She actually really enjoys her time at the convent. She doesn't want this kind of future as a daughter of nobility that is Laid out for like her and the rest of her family and so when her sister is about to give birth to her first child herself and her mother are called to the palace and her sister seems to be very distressed and she says that to the main character like you stay in the convent like you make sure that you do not end up in the situation that myself and our older sister has ended up in and this confuses the main character quite a bit like she doesn't really know what her sister means by that and her sister like never kind of like follows up on it but then a few years later she goes to visit her sister again and notices that she has bruises and her sister confides in her that she is actually being abused by the prince. So the main character takes it upon herself to visit, I think she's called a dust wife. She's like a witch that has like mastery over the dead. She asks the witch for a weapon that will help her to kill the prince and the witch sets her three impossible tasks and if she completes them, then the witch will give her this weapon. Now, I thought that this book was going to focus on the three impossible tasks, but that isn't the focus of this story. The main bulk of this story takes takes place after that where the main character and a host of companions are kind of on a mission to execute the prince. It did very much read like a fairy tale and I thought that it was very good in being in the style of a fairy tale but also like bringing more contemporary issues into the main narrative. Themes of like female solidarity, also like domestic abuse and I enjoyed it. I thought that it was a very good time. It was humorous in parts. There was a slight romantic subplot in it that I I enjoyed. I enjoyed the atmosphere 100%. I think that this was the book's strongest facet. But overall, I knew when I finished it that while I had a good time while I was in the book, it wasn't going to be anything that stuck with me that I carried with me for a long time. And so I gave it three stars because while I did enjoy it, like I would recommend it if you're in the mood for that kind of thing, I didn't find it to be especially impactful. I then read my generous three star and trust me, that really hurts to say because that is my most anticipated read of 2024 which is House of Flame and Shadow by Sarah J Maas. The longer I spend away from this book, like the more distance I have from this book, the more I'm like horrified at what I read. If you guys don't know what this book is, it is the third book in the Crescent City series. Now the first installment in this series remains to be my favourite book of all time, which makes this even more disappointing than it would be if it was just like the third book in a series that I had otherwise enjoyed. But in House of Earth and Blood, which is the first book, we are following a half fay woman called Bryce Quinlan, who is tasked with investigating a series of murders. The government, like all of the public, thought that they'd caught the murderer responsible two years prior to the main bulk of the story, but it seems that they were wrong and people are starting to be murdered all over the city again. So Bryce is brought in, she's like a antiquities dealer so she doesn't have anything to do with investigation at all but she's brought in by the archangel who is the governor of the city, Micah, because he thinks that she has a personal tie to this case and because it is extremely dangerous she is assigned a fallen angel in the form of Hunt Athelar to assist her in this investigation. The first book is quite slow 
a little bit info dumpy, I will admit, but it mainly focuses on found family trust, grief is a big part of it, um, trauma and healing trauma, rebuilding bonds, like relationships with people that have been broken and like learning to heal and recover. Like I would say healing and recovery are the main themes of House of Earth and Blood. And then it also has like a super cinematic 200 page, like epic conclusion to that book. And I didn't love the second book, but I had faith that Sarah was going to pull it together and come through with book three. Book two was just kind of very slow, didn't have a whole lot of payoff, but also introduced a couple of characters that felt kind of tedious, but I felt like I, I had faith. I've read every Sarah J Maas book. I had faith she was going to come through for book three, and this is honestly the worst Sarah J Maas book that I have ever read. The amount of loose ends we have, the amount of things that were introduced and kind of built up and hinted at in the first book and the second book that amounted to nothing, um, I'm used to Sarah J Maas having the majority of her characters play an integral role. She doesn't have in her other series a whole ton of pointless side characters. They all play at least a small part in the bigger picture. Here, even I would say the prominent side characters, some of them were pretty irrelevant and useless. There were so many loose ends, so many conveniences, multiple characters, including the main character of this story, acting out of character, but for no real reason to create tension that just truly did not need to be there in the regard to the main character. There were also characters, shall I say, that were new to this book in particular that I felt were acting a little bit strangely. We had the continuation of the plot of the side characters that felt very pointless in the second book, which I thought the reason why they were introduced in the second book is because they were going to play a massive role in book three. They did not. Their character, their storyline did continue to be pretty pointless. The romantic tension, the romance was barely there for the most part with a lot of the characters, which is fine for the last book in a series, but I felt like the way that the characters were behaving towards each other was also a little bit odd. We didn't have any stakes. There was no moments of high tension. The resolution of this was far too easy. We had reveals that led on from mysteries that have existed since book one, so like a good 2,000 pages ago, that were resolved in here in such an unenthusiastic and unsatisfying manner. Like we're getting payoff or reveals for things that we've been thinking about, that I've been thinking about for four years, and the way that they're delivered, I'm like, wow, I truly just do not care. I truly do not care. I have thought that Sarah J Maas's last three books have been pretty weak. I will be honest, and I have mentioned that when I've been reviewing them. Even though I still gave A Court of Silver Flames five stars, there were definitely five star elements of that book. And House of Sky and Breath, I did originally give it five stars, but upon reread, I lowered it to four. This one though really just takes the cake for being the worst one of the few. Like House of Sky and Breath was a prequel, like a prologue of what is to come in this book because it truly only goes downhill from there. And as somebody who has given pretty much all of Sarah J Maas's books five stars, to be sat here saying this is a three star read that realistically I should give two stars to is actually painful, like it hurts, it's disappointing. And I can't, I can tell you all of the things obviously as I have that I didn't like about this book, but I can't tell you specifically like what is missing that we have had in the rest of Sarah J Maas's books because this feels different. Like even when I started House of Sky and Breath, like it felt like a Sarah J Maas book. Like it gave me the same feeling that reading Sarah J Maas does. This, I felt nothing apart from anger and disappointment. <laughs> for the majority. So um, I have made a spoiler video on this. So if you have read this book and you wanna know my thoughts in detail, I do very much go into it. The video is over an hour long. So the thoughts are definitely there. If you guys are wondering if you should pick this up because you didn't love House of Sky and Breath very much, I would honestly say don't bother. And if you've only read House of Earth and Blood, I would say pretend it's a standalone because you're only gonna be disappointed if you continue with this series. I then continued on with one of my favorite manga series, which is Dreamin' Sun by Ichigo Takano. This one is volume five. And sadly, while this does still remain to be one of my favorite manga series, this installment in particular was not it. So if you're unfamiliar with this one, it is a shoujo manga, which is essentially like a, a YA romantic contemporary. And it is following a girl who has a disagreement or like she feels kind of out of place at home after her father. And I think 
think it's her stepmother, have a new baby. So she decides that she's going to leave. She packs up and she finds a drunk guy passed out in the park who invites her to live with him. So she agrees and he says that she can live with him providing that she fulfills his three requirements. The first one is that she tells him why she's run away from home. The second is that she finds his missing house key. And the third is that she has a dream and falls in love. So the series mainly focuses on the third of those requirements. And this is essentially like a YA version of New Girl because she moves into this house where the guy that was passed out in the park is the landlord, he's in his early 20s. And then there are two guys of high school age that also live there. She has a crush on one of the guys in the house and it is, it's just a YA contemporary. I really enjoy it because it's really sweet. It's kind of light, although it does deal with heavier topics in parts. It has some humor in it. And I think it's a good time. Like it's a good uplifting read for me. You know, the issue that I had with this volume in particular is that we are introducing a little bit of an age gap romance in here, bearing in mind that our main character is a minor. So it was majorly giving me the ick and this was published i think it was translated in was it 2009 yeah i think that it was translated in 2009 so it's even older than that so i kind of get why it would have that content because a lot of things in like the early 2000s just generally did but it was very uncomfortable to read and age has been brought into question when some of the characters are discussing things in this series so i do feel like eventually this little tangent is going to resolve and it's going to be like an age issue and everyone's going to move on and it's going to be fine but yeah it was definitely giving me the ick when there is like a guy in his early 20s entertaining a relationship with a girl who I would predict is potentially about 14 or 15. <laughs> it wasn't great. So yeah I did give this one three stars because of that because I enjoyed it as I enjoy every other installment in this series but that is a massive red flag. I also talking about massive red flags <laughs> Book seven in the Wheel of Time series, A Crown of Swords. I, I didn't like this one. I wouldn't necessarily say that this is my least favorite book in the Wheel of Time series overall, but it did have content in it that made me rate this book lower than I have any, any other installment in Wheel of Time. So if you guys are unfamiliar with this series to start off with, it is obviously like a classic epic high fantasy story about the struggle between light and dark as most epic high fantasy stories are. Everything in this world is cyclical, like the ages pass and the same events happen kind of over and over again. In the most recent ages, the world has been very slowly tipping towards the dark. And at this point, I feel like we're at a very poignant part in this struggle where if we don't start turning the world towards the light, we're gonna tip towards the dark forever. So this series is mainly following the Dragon Reborn, who is a pivotal role in this battle, who is reincarnated into every age. And sometimes he tips the world towards the light, sometimes he tips it a little bit more towards the dark. But as you can guess, the last few dragons have not been doing a great job. So we're following this era's Dragon Reborn, along with a handful of Tarverin, who are rare individuals that have the ability to alter the weave of the world as they try try and tip the world towards the light for good. So we all know I've had my issues with this series, but book six was my favorite installment in this series so far. I felt like the plot was really coming together and we had some massive like, oh my God, jaw dropping moments as well as decent pacing past the first 300 pages and some character development that I really enjoyed. So that one was my highest rated. This one had a very slow start. Like I've made spoiler videos for every book in this series. I'm having to combine this with book eight because I read all 700 pages of this and I filmed one clip because I didn't feel like anything really happened until around the page 500 to 550 mark. Up until that point it was very much a lot of it was Perrin's and Rand's inner monologues and also a lot of Aes Sedai politics because we have like a hundred different factions of Aes Sedai at this point all like plotting and trying to get one up over the other and then eventually like the plot did start to move a little bit. Unfortunately though the first thing of note that happened in this book is a massive red flag and a content warning because one of the characters is sexually assaulted in here and it is written off very casually. It isn't treated as a sexual assault. The character's feelings are disregarded and when they speak to other people about it, they are laughed at by other main characters in this series. Now, due to the nature of this incident and due to the time period that these books were written in, they were written in the 90s, I understand why this was written off to be casual and why nobody really takes this character seriously. But reading this 
from the perspective of being in 2024 i cannot overlook how disgusting and uncomfortable that scene was like even knowing the way that people thought about certain kinds of things like pre 2000 2010 it is still a massive red flag like it is my jaw hit the floor reading this in 2024 and there is a lot of stuff like of its time in this series like the relationships between men and women the way male and female characters are represented in here a lot of it is very very like not only of its time but coming from a author who was a little bit older I think when he started to write this series so he was like in his peak in like the 60s I feel so he it's also like an, an older man right in this series but that was still like took the cake for being one of the most uncomfortable things that I've ever read so typically if we if that didn't exist if that wasn't in this book I would have given this three stars but like I actually just cannot overlook the sexual assault in here and so I gave this one or two star rating. I then picked up something that was kind of disappointing because based on like what I've heard about this I expected to enjoy it a little bit more and that is Fruits Basket Volume 1 by Nosuka Takaya. This one is once again a shoujo manga. It does have a fantasy element though as this one is following a girl whose mother has passed away and she has gone to live with her grandfather but her grandfather is going to stay with relatives like he has other children other grandchildren and his house is being renovated so until that is done he is going to live with his other relatives and they are apparently not going to take this girl in so she ends up living in a tent on what she doesn't realize is private property and the family that owns this land find out that she's living there and invite her to stay with them because like it's the middle of like some really big storm when they discover that she's living in a tent on their land she finds out that they are all actually members they're like cursed with the spirits of the chinese zodiac and if they are embraced by a member of the opposite sex they will transform into that animal so one of the first i think the first First character in this family we're introduced to is possessed by the spirit of the dog of the Chinese zodiac and if he is embraced by a member of the opposite sex he will actually transform into a dog. So I heard before I went into this like this was highly recommended to me it's a lot of people's favorite manga series. I predominantly read like contemporary manga and comics it's just like the perfect genre for like a graphic format for me so I was very excited to try this one out and sadly I didn't love it I liked it but nothing about it really blew me away I just enjoyed it I literally can't say anything good or bad about it like I liked it and, and that was it I do have a favorite part of this this one contains 12 issues of like the regular manga and my favorite one was the last one which focuses on one of the older members of the family and their backstory which did have a romantic plot line and also a bittersweet like tone to it so i absolutely loved that element of this but overall like i i just liked it i did ask in the vlog where i read this like do you guys think that this gets better with every installment or is volume one what i can expect from the later volumes of this series and a lot of you guys did say that it does get better i don't know if i'm going to continue though if i'm being honest because while a lot of you guys said that you thought that it does get better with each volume a lot of you guys also said that you just watched the anime you haven't read the manga and you really love the anime so i feel like it would actually be a lot cheaper in money and also my time if i were to watch the anime instead and if any of you guys are interested it is the newer like the remake of the anime that was recommended to me I think there's one that's a little bit older that I believe was put out before the series was actually finished so I don't think if I'm being honest I don't think I'm going to continue this series I don't have an overwhelming desire to after reading book one but in the future I may potentially check out the anime so I gave this one a three stars really did like it but my feelings about it don't go past that at all really and then my final book of the month was not necessarily a disappointment this is like a bit of fatigue <laughs> when it comes to this series and it is my last two star of the month which was bloodlands by stacy marie brown so this one is the fifth installment in the savage land series which is the series that i'm currently reading for my patreon book club we are finishing it off in march and i'm actually so glad to be done with this series at this point because this one is a post-apocalyptic style fantasy romance following a girl who lives in a world that is split between the humans and the fae. Around the time that she was born the veil between the worlds of the human and the fae fell which resulted in a war and the way that they resolved this is to separate the humans and the fae so that they don't really interact and there's like a fae leader and a human leader of the city of Budapest where this is set. So our main character Braxley is the ward of the king and from her position of privilege she steals drugs from the trains that transport them through the city. She then puts the drugs onto the black market so that the people that need the money can profit from them instead 
instead of the profits just lying in the pockets of the elite. So one day as she's doing this, she gets caught as the train passes through the checkpoint between the human and the fey areas of the land. And she is thrown into a maximum security prison where she meets the alluring half fey warrior, Warwick Farkas. So I have never said that this is like the best series that I've ever read, but it is very addictive and it is very compelling. It is also super repetitive. It's a little bit tedious. I don't love the smut. I actually skipped all of the smut in here because I'm over it. And I feel like the novelty is wearing off this series for me. So when I read the first three installments, they're super fast paced. They're super easy to get through. You can eat them up. They're very addictive, very compelling. But at this point at book five, I'm kind of over it because it is truly just the same thing happening over and over and over again and the fact that they're easy to get through isn't kind of enough to really make me root for this series anymore. I did read this when I was sick in the week like I just spent I did a 24 hour readathon with my patrons and just blasted through it so I actually because of my mental state due to being <laughs> ill I don't really remember very much about it either and I'm not even worried about that it doesn't even matter that I don't remember very much about this because the series is like super just take everything with a pinch of salt like nothing is all that deep the stakes are never truly that high it's just a fun time which as you guys know is not enough for me to read most of the time like I don't want a fun time I want my mind to be blown I want my soul to be rearranged when I read a book I don't even know what that means but that's what I'm aiming for so this one I gave two stars to I pretty much gave the rest of the series three stars because I do consistently enjoy the series but at this point it's just like this is just the same as reading book two like nothing is particularly different and actually when we got towards the end of this book the characters ended up in pretty much exactly the same situation they were in in page one so it was even more redundant than some of the earlier installments in this series but regardless I am interested in seeing how the series wraps up in book six and I will obviously be reading that to conclude my patreon read along of this series but I'm also very excited that we're going to be moving on to a new series very soon at this point I did also read 100 pages of the one book that I have that is still left on my TV we are. That one is Bone Spindle by Leslie Vedder. It was my Patreon pick for January this year. I got about, I think about 20% of the way into it, which is I think around 80 pages. And it's very like, it's an action adventure story, which isn't really my favorite. Also like a YA fantasy. And also because it's a retelling of Sleeping Beauty, I expected it to be more fairy tale esque in atmosphere, kind of like Nettle and Bone is, but it actually feels a lot like a Western or like an Indiana Jones style adventure story at this point and I'm not super vibing with it so I felt like I was going to really drag my feet and end up in a slump if I continued on with that so I put it on pause at the moment I am hoping to circle back around to it in March and finish it out but um yeah towards the end of February I just wasn't really in the mood to push through that for the sake of pushing through those were all of the books that I read in the month of February as I said I've already finished one book in March and I'm halfway through two others so March is also looking to be a solid reading month for me which is very 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 exciting but down in my comments let me know what your favorite book that you read in February was honestly I couldn't tell you because they were all bad <laughs> or not bad but the ones that weren't bad weren't good either I feel like if I had to pick a favorite it would be nettle and bone and I have very lukewarm feelings about that so maybe I just don't I just don't I don't have a favourite of February and I'm really not sure how to feel about that. But let me know what your favourite book of February is. Let's bring the tone up in the comments. And aside from that, guys, please don't forget to like this video if you liked it and subscribe if you wanna. You head to my description box, you'll find a link to my Goodreads Instagram and Twitter if you'd like to follow me on any of those, as well as link to my bookish candle website, the Etsy for that, and a 10% off discount code. But that's it from me today, guys. Bye! Oh, you bite your friend like chocolate. You say you will go where nobody knows With guns hidden under our petticoats We're never gonna quit it, no, we're never gonna quit it, no